It is now my distinct honor to welcome the Chief of Naval Operations back to Newport and the Naval War College. A native of Butler, Pennsylvania, Admiral Greenert graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1975 and completed studies in nuclear power for service as a submarine officer. His career as a submariner included assignments aboard the fast attack submarines USS Flying Fish and Tautog, the research submarine NR-1, the fleet ballistic missile submarine USS Michigan Gold Crew, and command of the fast attack submarine USS Honolulu. His other major command assignments included Commander Submarine Squadron 11, Commander Naval, U.S. Naval Forces Marianas, Commander of the U.S. 7th Fleet, and Commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Prior to becoming CNO, he served as the 36th <laughs> Vice Chief of Naval Operations. In 1992, he was awarded the Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for inspirational leadership. He assumed duty as the 30th Chief of Naval Operations on 23 September 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 30th Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greenett. Thank you. You know it's always difficult coming after Christensen in speaking, in uh, command, and you name it. Uh, he's a good officer and exactly why we put him up here. Uh, I have to take care of a little bit of admin before I provide my prepared remarks. First, I apologize. I have a little bit of laryngitis, so hey, ain't that a good thing? Because it's going to be a little shorter than what otherwise. But we should give a hand to the band. What do you say to the band? And if, if the individual who sang the national anthem is still with us, please identify yourself. We really want to give you a hand. That was magnificent. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And I give you all big kudos for singing the national anthem. I spent a lot of time overseas throughout my career, and most countries that, were, that I attend have attended events, they sing their national anthem. So all the grumpuses down here where I work in Washington, they just kind of stare out there and think about how important they are and don't sing the national anthem. So my hat's off to you. I think that's our future. Nicely done, nicely done. You know, uh, this is a great country, the United States of America. This is, and joining the Navy, you get second choices. And if you don't believe me, anytime you see James D. Kelly, Dean after it, or Jonathan W. Greener, Chief of Naval Operations, and those of you that know us know this country gives you second choices, and this Navy is a forgiving Navy. There's a lot of leaders out there that we owe quite a bit to. And we will not run for office without checking with several people uh, accordingly. <laughs> uh, John Christensen, you owe me a round, by the way. I got 18 guns, so we go over the club afterward. You can buy me that round, by the way, OK? That's OK with me. And my last piece of admin. Actually, I do have a few remarks here. There's an individual here that I have had the honor of knowing he and his, his spouse for uh, a number of years who serves now uh, at the college. We are so honored to have him here. This is an individual, this is a couple who gave so much to their Navy and to their country. They are one of the bravest couple, uh, and he is among the bravest individuals I have ever served with internationally in the Navy. And I'm talking about Admiral Hilermo Barrera and his wife, Anna Maria. Would you please stand and allow us to give you our pleasure. The Colombian Navy is a superb Navy and would not be so without the work of this couple. So Mr. President, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for taking care of educating the next generation of leaders. I couldn't agree with you more in how you describe how this college, how this course, how this institution is viewed jointly and internationally. I hear about it all the time. So folks, I'd like to talk to you, the graduates today, 
about a little bit about three things. Why I think this course that you just took, and I, all of them, talking about all of them, is important for you, and how it's going to help you deal with our choices, our issues here in the future, and a little, little bit about rebalancing to the Asia Pacific and where we're going in our Navy and in our Department of Defense. So it's a good course you took. It's great. It provides you the opportunity to assess yourself, your situation, your service, your Navy as it may be, maybe your country and where it is going. I'm hopeful that you are recharged intellectually and that maybe you see things more clearly. And as you look to see things more clearly, you may say, hey, things aren't nearly as clear as I thought they were. And that's okay because that's the way it is. That's the world we live in today. And that's probably, when you looked into history, the world that those went before you lived in when they were out there. You can talk about Midway, Coral Sea, the Battle of the War of 1812, and things aren't always as they appear in the little brochure until you read into the history and see what kind of challenges were these people facing. They were just like you and me. They were JOs at one time, and they had some hard things to do. The world's not black and white. You need some context, and you need some perspective. And this course should have given you some opportunity to get a sense for that. It is going to take patience, understanding, and looking at other perspectives to move ahead in the job we've got to do out there. You look at information dominance and the cyber aspect. You look at anti-axis, area denial, and the need to get into places around this world. You look at piracy, maritime intercept operations in the maritime arena. You look at humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. It's all over the place, but that's your future. That's our future. That's what we got to deal with. So we can't, can't really look and loiter on the past and what was and what we want it to be. It's going to take innovation, flexibility, and above all, resolve. Look, we're entering a different fiscal reality. If you've been in your service in the last 11 years, most of you have, and I don't know what you did before that, life's been pretty good fiscally. But the 20 years before that, the time that I was in, it wasn't like that. And it's not going to be like that. We're going back to a more difficult time. And it's going to take all that stuff I just talked about before to do this right. But it's been done before. You can do this. It's not that people haven't faced up to that challenge. You're, we're entering an era of increased maritime demand. It's a fact of life. You just say, hey, how come people, you know, why does America need a Navy? Well, America needs a Navy. And the good news is, your government, your, your national command authority, if you wear the white out there or something blue that has maritime, they're going to be asking for you. There ain't going to be a whole hell of a lot more of you to do it. So you're going to have to figure this out. We'll be figuring this out. Now, history will be helpful to you, but it's not going to be your answer. You're in a unique era. Everybody was that dealt with the kind of challenge you're going to deal with. It's not the same as the pre-war of the last century. It's like it but it's not exactly the same. So, dealing with the choices and the challenges. Look, we're at an inflection point. Things have, we needed a new strategy. We have a new strategy. And we needed it for a host of reasons. I'll give you three easy ones. Number one, the Budget Control Act. Well, that'll give you one right off the bat. And the deficit that this country is in, that the world is in, dictates that we have to get our fiscal house in order. Well, it's gonna affect things and things won't be the same, the stuff we buy will change. Number two, we're ending an era of operations in the Middle East. You know that, Iraqi freedom, okay, done. Okay, new dawn, we like to say done, we're still working it, and you know the story on enduring freedom in Afghanistan. But there's a new emerging Mideast of, of problems out there in the Asia Pacific and the concerns. The Department of Defense has developed a strategy to deal with it. I think it's effective. We had an open, transparent process for the whole strategy. The president was involved personally in this, your president. And we're revising our maritime strategy. This institution will have a part in that, has had a part in that, and I think we'll be done with it. Some like to think we'll be done in a matter of months. Trust me, folks, this will take longer. We'll probably be done with it next spring because we've got to do it right, not do it quickly. So meanwhile, we kind of have to get ready for heavy weather. So what do you do when you get ready for heavy weather? Well, first of all, you got to make sure your people 
are taken care of. They've got to put the slickers on. They've got to batten down the hatches. You've got to make sure they're safe out there on the deck. You've got to find the right course to steer, and you've got to stay with it and, wear, and bear through it. And in my view, I gave you six words if you read my sailing directions to get ready for this, to get us through this period of time and to move on ahead. I picked them almost a year ago. To me, they're still effective. I still see it almost exactly the same way. And that is, number one, war fighting has to be first. That is how we will be evaluated. And I tell you, it's in all your uniforms out there. And that's probably those of you who are international. That's how you're going to be viewed. If your country calls on you, you've got to go out and get it done. You've got to bring relevant capability today. And you've got to build tomorrow's capabilities, not just in platforms. It doesn't matter how many Joint Strike Fighters and P-8s and the right ship I get out there. If they can't, if they aren't whole, if they can't do the job, it won't matter. We've got to operate forward in this Navy. That is where we are most effective. That is where we've always been most effective. Today we have 100 ships on deployment of the 285 in our Navy. 50 of them are in the Asia Pacific, 30 of them are in the Arabian Gulf. You get the percentage, it's pretty easy, huh? Over divided by 100. And so that's the way it'll be in the future relative ratio as we work forward. And we'll need innovative ways to increase that presence tomorrow, and we'll do that. Third, we've got to be ready. We need confident and proficient crews to get the job done. That's where you come in. You have to make sure that your people are confident that they can go out and get the job done. That's what be ready means to me. Now look, these tenants apply in my boardroom in the halls of the Pentagon, and I tell you, in many of your service chiefs, my, my fellow service chiefs, but they should apply in your wardroom and in your ready room out there. I expect you to apply these tenants and view your decisions through this lens as you go out to get the job done. And for those of you who are our joint and our international partners, I'm committing to you, we'll adapt what we're out there to do to resonate with what you need and with what we've got to do together. Our major focus will be in that way. The heads of Navy that I talk to at, at this very campus and the International Sea Power Symposium see things the very same way. Now, in the future, you've heard the President, You've heard our Secretary of Defense. Asia Pacific is going to be our number one focus for our strategic guidance. And it is. It's in our strategic guidance. We are balancing toward that direction. And you just saw, or I just mentioned, 50 out of 100 ships that we have out there are in the Asia Pacific. So we're pretty much set in that direction. We will innovate to improve our presence in the Arabian Gulf, looking at Bahrain. We will innovate in Europe as we bring four destroyers to home port in Rota, and we'll innovate in the Southern Command as well. Our presence will alter some because we'll have alternative ships, but our presence will be there. We will increase allied cooperation and our effectiveness, and we're working that hard today. In the Middle East, it is an increasingly maritime theater. It's just heading in that direction. General Mattis is very clear when he talks about it. And frankly, the Mideast is our near-term concern. We have a very high level of rotational deployment there today. We have two carrier strike groups. We've had two carrier strike groups there in the Arabian Gulf for over two years. And we're looking to see what that necessity may be in the future. We will bring more partners and allies into building partnership capacity in that theater. In Europe, we'll continue to support our allies. And the key, as I mentioned before, will be bringing those four destroyers to Rota. It'll serve our ballistic missile defense mission in Europe as we work with our partners, but it'll also free up destroyers to move into other theaters as well. In the Southern Command and the African Command, we'll have new platforms, different platforms, to resonate and replace traditional presence, which was effectively the ships we had today were the ships we had to send over because that's what we had today. Joint high-speed vessels, literal combat ships, and a float forward staging base, a new concept. These are things that we'll see come into being in the future, and they will resonate with the requirements that we have in the future. But again, Asia Pacific will be our long-term focus. It's where five of our seven defense treaties are. It's where six 
of the, of the 20, the G20 economies are. It's where the largest on, uh, armies of the world are. Half of our deployed fleet is there, as I mentioned. Half of that deployed fleet, about 25 ships, are permanently home ported in Asia Pacific. Now our balance is gonna occur in four ways. Number one, it's ships, and I just mentioned that. Number two, it'll be capability. And our capabilities, as they move to the Asia Pacific, will be guided by the air-sea battle concept. That is how we're gonna, that is the lens, that's the way we'll move our capabilities and the capabilities that we'll choose. We will intellectually balance to the Asia Pacific, focus in our attention on the security challenges that exist out there, but also our war fighting skill sets will resonate with those that we need in the Asia Pacific. And lastly, basing. We have about 55%, if you will, of our ships in the Western, in the Pacific, or on the West Coast, and that will shift to 60% of our ships in the West Coast or home ported in the Western Pacific. So what do I need from you? Look, I showed you the examples of the hard choices and where we gotta go in the future. We're gonna have to address the near and the far term concerns. There's no doubt about it. And they'll be slightly different the way that we address them. So I need you, the leadership, who are now intellectually recharged. Hopefully you've had the time to assess where you stand. You see the world isn't exactly like you may have seen it before. Even if you had your 05 command, you should th see things somewhat differently. Admiral Christensen mentioned it. I need you to be bold. You don't have a lot of time. You may think you do. You don't have a lot of time, okay, in your career. You're, it's limited and it goes by pretty fast. I need bold leaders. I need confident leaders. You should be confident. This institution's a great institution. You're ready to go. And I need you to be willing to be accountable. Accountable to the country, accountable to your bosses, and accountable to the sailors, the soldiers, the airmen, and the Coast Guardsmen that you're gonna lead, and the Marines that you will lead out there. The 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, we talked about it this year. We talked about Coral Sea, 70th anniversary. Talked about Midway, 70th anniversary. We were successful there because we had bold and accountable leaders who saw an opportunity and they took it and they took risk with calculation, calculated risk, not foolish risk calculated risk. For you allied and joint partners, you are a source of ideas for us in the Navy, and you have shared concerns and shared ideals. And we can't do it right in this world without you. So hopefully one of the things you definitely took away from here was how to nurture a relationship, how to build trust and confidence, because you're gonna have to leverage the trust and confidence in the network that you get today from your international and your joint partners. It happened in our success in natural disasters in Haiti, in Chile, and in Japan in the last few, two years alone. It's the friendships that you gain here that will endure for many years for probably the lifetime of your career. You got to learn to trust. And if you learn to trust somebody, then you learn how to accept what they tell you, and then you're gonna learn how to do calculated risk, and your risk will be successful. So let me close with this. Enjoy your accomplishment, but get ready. We got work to do out there, and it's, it's here. It's out there waiting for you today. I hope you're ready for it, because it's ready for you. You have the experience, and you now have the intellectual capacity, and I need you to go out there, and I need you to demonstrate it. There are a lot of families and friends here today, and my message to you today is thank you very much. Thank you for being the wind under the wings of these graduates here today that have chosen to serve. And thank you for imbuing in them the values and the virtues that they need to carry out their mission, including integrity and trust and confidence and all the other ideals that we know are important. So congratulations, graduates. Thank you for serving so far, and thank you for continuing to serve. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America.